with a thank you for the kind introductions. It is actually my pleasure to be here, a little bit of airplane flights and so on, and fast in and out, but as I think I will try to convey today, I really, more than ever, look at this as a crossroad for all of you here. If we stay on the track we're on, you're going to have academics studying your children and keep studying them. Unfortunately, and I will explain this to you, you will have alternative medicine keep repeating everything they've done for 28 years, and it has never worked for adults, and unfortunately it's now your children. And so what I'm going to try to do is convey that if I can get you to think and take away the name autism as defined by Dr. Cantor, Think of your children as having autistic symptoms. I hope that some of you are here with children with ADHD symptoms, learning disorder symptoms. As I was just telling the story, and this applies to thinking of this as a medical epidemic, I have a mother who has chronic fatigue syndrome, taking care of her. She keeps telling me her daughter is having more and more trouble as she's going higher in the schools. But her daughter is really not labeled. She's just very shy, withdrawn, miserable, unhappy. And I said, well, let me take a look at things. Sure enough, she had markers for neuroimmune, start treating her, and, at, and as you told me about a week ago, the girl comes home to her now and says she's so happy, she's thriving in school. So part of what I want to convey is if we take away the myth of autism, we, you, every time I say autism, you can substitute ADHD, chronic fatigue, LD, and let's look at what may be really happening to your children. One out of every 110 babies born today, born today are diagnosed with autism. 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 That's an increase of 57%. 57% since 2002. When autism is 1% of the children, the reality is that we're not really dealing with something called autism. We're dealing with a bunch of children who are ill. He stopped speaking. He stopped looking at us. He stopped responding to his name. He'd say it over and over, and Jacob, 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 and just no acknowledgement. He started to become less uh, interactive, less eye contact. He wasn't engaging in activities that kids his age were participating in. He was putting his hands over his ears, sensitive to sound. He would sit in the corner and spin in a circle or he would take a car and spin the wheels and watch the wheels spin. He would lay on the floor and watch the wheels just go, and that's all he did. She was um, kind of really in her own little world. These children present with multiple symptoms that we were trained were medical, but somehow we're writing it all off as autism and psychological it's impossible for a developmental or genetic disorder to ever become an epidemic, and yet we are condemning these parents and children to no future. They're telling us all the things he's not going to be able to do in, in terms of having a normal, healthy, fulfilling life. And that maybe I should look into, you know, a group home later that he would probably never perform, like, independently. His uh, preschool teacher at the time said she questioned his ability to learn. And that was devastating, you know, to have, to have someone tell you that they didn't think that he would ever learn anything um, and that he would be sort of stuck. All we wanted for him is to experience some normality, have relationships with other people, connect. You know, people told me he would never care for anyone in the same way that other people did and that he would never have emotional connections to other people. The speech pathologist said, your child will never learn to love. That's a really hard pill to swallow. 
I have essentially watched families go to experts around the country, go to leaders around the country, and realize that those experts, those leaders, have completely turned their back on these families. They are desperate, they need help, and that's supposed to be our job as pediatricians. When you get in this world of autism, there's two million people trying to sell you something or trying to push something on you to make your kid better. Jude had nine doctors and therapy, therapy, therapy every day. He was working 35 hours a week from age three till five doing behavior modification. I mean, he was put through it, really put through it. It was really, really hard to watch. It was at that time uh, we found something on the internet uh, about uh, this doctor, Dr. Goldberg. Uh, he would actually uh, do blood tests and, and see, uh, you know, if there's any type of uh, medical reason for this. If you throw out autism, then you suddenly realize we have a massive medical epidemic affecting the brains and bodies of these children. It is time we recognize that these children are ill and have autistic-like symptoms but do not have autism. Call it what you want. Call it what you want. Call it what you want. But don't call it autism. But don't call it autism. But don't call it autism. We were reserved. We weren't sure what to believe because this was probably the 15th or 16th thing that we have tried. And after about two weeks, it was like he gained a year. Month after month, he was able to do more things. And one day he opened his mouth and he had within a week a 2,000 word vocabulary. My son got straight A's in junior high, wants to go to MIT. He's incredibly smart. He says he loves me. Mommy, I love you. Gives me hugs and kisses. I remember calling my friend Mario and going, guess what? You're never going to believe it. And it was like a final breakthrough because all of a sudden, I had a connection with my daughter. I thought, yes, she's feeling that emotion. She's getting it. She's connecting. She's, And that was huge. It was huge. I no longer had that doubt that he's going to be able to take care of himself. He has a future now. If you knew what we've gone through to get to this moment, and I was very excited. I just pray that other people have the same hope, because it's just not reserved for our family. There is hope. There is hope. There is hope. Now, when we did that movie, the parent group, which I hope many of you will think about getting involved in, we need local groups and we need a national movement. But that parent group helped put this video together, and to show you how completely we have sold professionals and parents on the idea of autism, which means you can't recover, to my shock on the internet, coming into the office, people would tell me they're claiming those were actors. I will promise you their patience in my practice that what I hope to convey today is that instead of looking at this like you don't have a right to expect your children to recover, let's change the equation. Let's get professionals, therapists, and parents involved that if your children really don't have autism, as defined by Dr. Canner, they have a right to be treated and a chance to recover. One of the mothers up there, I was hoping she would be here, but she couldn't make it today, and bring her daughter. Her daughter, at a visit about five or six years ago, said, hey mom, do you want me to pretend I can't talk again? Do you know how many people, experts, do not realize what's going on in these kids' brains? They are thinking, and as I will try to convey, if you take away the label of autism, I would argue respectfully we're abusing your children. We're leaving them in pain, we're leaving them uncomfortable, making the assumption they are intelligent. How would any of us feel if we couldn't talk and say things? So I'm going to try to outline one of the things that has stood up for me, and again, I want to convey this to parents and professionals, is I didn't come into this as an autistic doctor or specialist. To, I am pleased to say I started as a pediatrician. 
And realistically, my life has changed. I am proud to this day of my training. I trained UCLA. I trained LA County USC. I was thrilled with my pediatric training. But then I saw everything starting to change. And so began a journey that I hope I can show you. There's no reason to repeat the journey. Let's go forward. Let's not keep repeating it. Background. As I said, I trained UCLA. A lot of rotations through Children's Hospital. Ironically, I almost couldn't have asked for better training. I had infectious disease experts, immunology, allergies. And I was in an era that we thought medicine was wonderful. We were going to use our skills to help people do better. Somehow under this myth that's all been thrown away, in my early practice, and again, I think part of what's actually helped me work with your children, is I was a pediatrician. I loved helping parents raise their kids. I was taught by many advanced people to think a little differently. I thought of allergies. I thought of keeping a kid clear, keeping a kid healthy. What to me should be preventative medicine. But I found to my dismay, I had to change things. Now, in my practice, again, when I had a large practice, it was actually the third largest of the valley, I always practiced preventative. I trained in an error, and this is something I'll come back to a few times. I never gave an immunization to a child that was sick. If a child had a cold, it was, bring the child back in a few weeks. We'll do the vaccination then. Unfortunately, part of the problem is in efficiency, in whatever you want to call it, pediatrics evolved to a place that literally, if your child is alive and standing, they should get their vaccines. I believe in vaccines. I will stress this to you later. I'm not a doctor that doesn't believe in vaccines. But I don't believe in the way we're doing it. I think we have to get back to how I trained in medical school. You did not give a vaccine in the nursery, ever. You didn't give seven, eight vaccines at one time, and you did not give a vaccine when a child was sick. Now, in, I want to make some points, and I think these are very critical points, because I trained in a medical school era where, unfortunately and retrospectively, we thought we knew everything. <laughs> Somewhere by the 70s, the science had evolved. We had discovered viruses. We had discovered bacteria. We had the science to understand mechanisms of disease. Unfortunately, as I will point out to you, rules I was taught then by excellent professors have gone astray. And unfortunately, our knowledge didn't lead into a field that said, let's study what we don't understand. It led to HMO medicine. A, B, C, D, and if you don't have A, B, C, D, we're really sorry. Well, I trained in a system that you figured out what was wrong. Viral titers were a guy. We knew they didn't prove a diagnosis, but if they went up, you made the assumption that kid had just recently been exposed to that virus or had it. Now, viral titers don't mean anything. Childhood illnesses were a thing of the past. Parents who had grown up terrified, the very sad thing is you are more terrified every day now about what to do about having a family, have children. And yet when I was training, we were thrilled because the childhood illnesses that had plagued basically your grandparents and parents were, were disappearing. Now, autism, childhood illnesses are returning, and unfortunately you guys are literally petrified as parents. I was also taught, you do not give a child, I could argue adult, any medications that were not long-term healthy unless you had an absolute medical indication. Now, under the guise of a word, forgive me, but your children presumably are already injured. I want to read something a moment because as I see new patients, I get... Lots of records. 
And this was a consultation at a major medical center on a child. I discussed with Jack Parents that autism spectrum conditions are behavioral, neurodevelopmental conditions that are considered to be due to differences in early brain development. Now, even though, and I've been trying to fight this fight for a while, I, I would have many parents telling me, oh no, they're, they're talking illness, they're talking disease. You will not find a credible peer-reviewed paper that doesn't talk neurodevelopmental. If we took away the idea that your children are somehow mysteriously injured, something mysteriously went wrong, we would have a real medical crisis to help all of you. So essentially, I do not believe, I regard your children as children. Therefore, I will not use medications. The academic world is using Risperidol, Abilify. The latest thing is they're going to give your children tetracyclines for neuroimmune inflammation. Now, I'm trying to make a big point about medical school. I trained UCLA. I wasn't in some third country. The second or third lecture in pediatrics was we no longer give tetracyclines to children because it damages their teeth and bones. Now, how have we come to a world that academics will think of giving your children tetracyclines? Unfortunately, alternative medicine does HBOT, chelation, mega supplements, and all of these things as a pediatrician I was told would never be healthy for a child. You, I was taught you do not prescribe, treat, or dose inappropriately. Today, anything goes. Your kids go on and off of antivirals, on and off of antifungals, on and off of this, on and off of that. I was taught by excellent professors, if you're going to treat something, you better do the job. When you start and stop medicines, you build resistance. All this is doing is actually making your children harder to help, not easier. And I trained in an error. We were going to do everything better. I would never forget these lectures. We were going to do a better job for parents than our folks did in the 50s and 60s. We were going to help parents raise better kids, good egos, good self-esteem. These children and you guys as families are in the worst place you could ever name. I was taught about heavy metals. You worry about that in children. Lead was a big issue. But I promise you, and this is where I'm going to try to convey this and say it politely, but you guys as parents have got to somehow, you shouldn't have to be, but you almost have to become your child's doctor. You have to, you didn't train in medical school, it's not fair. But I promise you, if you read the literature, you read the history of heavy metals, there is zero association of autism. We have been fighting the wrong fights, and that's actually part of why the academic world doesn't listen. If you try to tell them heavy metals cause autism, they look at you like, what are you telling them? Well, we have a long history that says heavy metals are toxic. They're not good for a child's brain, but they're not hidden away in a mysterious way, and they certainly can't cause autism. We were taught to think of reasons, what was causing something. There's no cause for autism, if you read out there. Your children think about this. You're desperate. You're condemned that your children can't really be what they're supposed to be. And yet, as I say to most patients and new parents, think about this. Give me one objective test that says your kids have autism or have any real injury to their brain. Children, when I grew up, had lots of energy. The joke was teenagers burned the candle at both ends. I essentially learned in my regular practice, as I would do checkups, it was almost becoming a foreign idea. I'd tell a mom that when we were kids, we did all this stuff. They'd look at me and the rule out there is, oh, teenagers are tired. They can't do all that stuff. Well, wait a minute. If in the 60s and 70s we could, maybe something's wrong with kids today that they're not healthy. 
The pharmaceutical and medical system work together to solve critical illnesses. You guys, out of frustration with the medical system, and I'm frustrated with it too, by the way. I actually, I do believe in academics. I believe there are good people out there that could change. But right now, the people in control, you have a system entirely focused on propitiating autism. And as long as they propitiate autism, and some parents are told the pharmaceuticals are the bad guys, essentially you are missing the biggest step that could help your children. Think about this. My wife keeps going alternate universe lately. <laughs> the, some of you know, the Mind Institute came out, and this Mind Institute is part of Autism Speaks and all the big guys out there, and they came out about a month ago. We now have a second form of autism, immune. You heard that? Now, think about this. If, in that alternate universe, they had said the truth academically, we have a bunch of children with immune issues. They have autistic symptoms. They have ADHD symptoms. They have different symptoms. Instantly, tomorrow morning, you would have seen the pharmaceutical companies jump in, literally spending hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe a billion, to help your children. I would argue they're not the enemy. We just need to point them and give them a chance to go in the right direction to help your kids. Now, when I trained, again, UCLA, I was taught, and some people still believe, colic was neurodevelopmental. It was a baby's immature brain. Well, thankfully, I was taught by a very cutting-edge allergist, immunologist, think of food. I always, with, with, with babies in the practice, I always made sure that when I introduced foods, I didn't upset stomach, I didn't give them gas. Now, I find out after I'm in practice for a year or two, Europe always believed it was GI. We are wrong, especially when it comes to foods. I'll hit this later. But because we don't have an absolute test that says something reacts, we tend to tell you, oh, your kids are okay. And as I was saying, in fact, to Sarah and Matt, we grew up, I grew up in an era, most people, you had eczema, put your cream on. I was taught, wait a minute, someone's got eczema? What's causing it? Why are they breaking out? Now, I was a little bit at the edge then, but believe me, it's a lot healthier way to think, and it is the right way to think. Autism was so rare, I was told, and this is UCLA with Dr. Lovas, that if I saw one child with autism in my entire lifetime of practice, it was one too many. Now, 30 years later, they're coming out of the woodwork. Most pediatricians have six to 12 of these in their practice. My hope to all of you is, pediatricians have been excluded. As long as the academy says, we're sorry, but your children have autism, I really wonder how bad many pediatricians feel, because what can they do? But if we throw the switch, if we recognize your kids are ill, it will give pediatricians the right to get involved, and start to try to help your children. When I trained, autism not only was unheard of, but you never had families with two or three children. If you go back and read the literature in the 40s, 50s, when all this began, there's nothing, anybody with a professional background and reads that would understand there's nothing about the presentation that would make you think genetic. But we are spending hundreds of million dollars on genetics. I have spoken to private geneticists who their attitude is they can't even go to their donors to get more money because they've been there, done it, it's a dead end. But only our government and our academic institutions can keep spending your money studying genetics. Um, science and logic were behind all diseases. You had to figure out what caused it, what was the reason. Now, when, I, when you look at what's being written, what's been done, 
It's like somehow we've lost all scientific reasoning. And again, when I trained, there was a firm understanding, physiology, biology, and I'll come back to this for your children, but if you understand physiology, biology, you understand there's only certain ways something can really happen to your children. At this point, there seems to be a complete disregard for physiology, biology, and under the guise of psychiatric, anything goes. Don't forget, autism started under a psychiatric label. There was no objective criteria in the 50s, and 50 years later, we don't have one objective criteria on your children in medical school. You have, again, this was UCLA. It's a very good school. Somebody had abnormal IgM levels, you worked them up for a coat lymphoma. You worked them up for possible cancer. Someone had a positive ANA, rule out autoimmune disease. A young adult with shingles, rule out lymphoma or occult cancer. Now, those things are happening to many young adults, and it's just accepted. People have positive ANAs, oh, it's happening. You, you, you have shingles, well, a lot of people are breaking out with shingles. But you know what? That's the tip of the iceberg. You don't break out with shingles unless your immune system is stressed. And start to think how many 20, 30-year-olds out there are now having outbreaks like that. And almost crazily, we were taught to think of reasons for seizures. A child had a seizure, you work them up. And one of the biggest reasons for certain types of seizures was we knew herpes viruses could go to the brain. They like the temporal lobe of the brain. Now, I've had parents, I'll come to this later when I talk about seizures, but I've had parents that kids are presenting with epilepsy, full-blown 100 seizures a week, 100 seizures a month. One of them had the resources to honestly say that she took her kid to the top 10 pediatric neurologists in the country. And every one of them replied, it's idiopathic. Now, idiopathic is a polite way of saying, we don't know what causes it. As I will explain to you later, I couldn't sit in an academic institute, say that to a parent with a straight face. And I was trained, again, in a thorough system. Someone had a strep, you recultured them. Someone had an ear infection, you followed it up. Now, in cost effectiveness, we don't recheck your kids. Now, what I want to bring you back to, I know you all can't go back to medical school. Um, that wasn't your careers or choosing. But I honestly believe if we're going to see parents come together in an intelligent, focused effort, you have to understand a little bit about our bodies. In school, you learn about body systems. We have an endocrine system, we have an immune system, we have hematology, ear, nose, and throat, cardiovascular, pulmonary, GI, GU, musculoskeletal, and neuro. Now what I want to try to bring you to is if something starts to break down in your children, there has to be an explanation. Look at your children. If you look at their past histories, they have photosensitivity. Back when I was in medical school, photosensitivity meant you had a virus or inflammation on your brain till proven otherwise. How many of your children, under the guise of the A word, are sun sensitive and nobody pays attention to it? Your kids have frequent ear infections. Thyroid endocrine issues, sensory processing, auditory processing, abnormal EEGs. Again, as I will point out, seizures, abnormal EEGs had nothing to do with whatever Dr. Kanner spoke about as autism. Your children are tired. Everyone knows that. I will argue a tired kid is not healthy. If we just come back to a simple point, it's time the system started to figure that out. They have OCD symptoms, and a key point for all of you, 
Fine gross motor abnormalities are occurring all over the place. You have ADD kids with it, you have autistic children with it. Well, again, let's go back to logical science. If in the 50s, 60s, 60s, nobody talked about motor issues with these children. In fact, as I was putting the book together, one of the editors reminded me that kids who could put little things together, super focused, super fine motor control, were one of Tanner's original criteria. So I would respectfully say, if your children have motor issues, they can't have autism. Now, in partly trying to defend the mistakes out there, the academic system, I will admit that even when we were in the 70s, we thought we knew a lot of things. Again, science really advanced. But the brain itself was somewhat of a black box. You had MRIs, you had CAT scans, you still have MRIs and CAT scans, but we learned MRIs and CAT scans are just showing you structure. What's the shape of the brain? Is something malformed? Is something been damaged? It doesn't show function, and thankfully, most of your children are not injured brains, but they are dysfunctional brains. We really didn't understand brain function. And classification, labeling of almost all mental dysfunction was by symptoms. One of the explanations is no longer totally justified, but an explanation is, in medical school, anything that had to do with the child learning wasn't our job as a doctor. It was under psychiatry. And that's about the only rational point I can give for why are we in this mess today. Now, we're in the 21st century, you guys. Let's start demanding that tools are used that can give some answers about your children's brains. Neurospec, as I will show you, tells you function. What are they doing? I've had people walk in, new patients, with studies from the Mind Institute, from the NIH, paperwork like this. I would respectfully say there's not anything in that paperwork that I couldn't have done in the 70s. And while we're getting more sophisticated MRIs, we now have functional MRIs, 3D MRIs, it still isn't going to help because this is not a structural point. Now, let's go back to trying to understand your children. Essentially, if they're born okay, your child comes out, for all intent and purposes, a good kid. The doctors send you home and say, hey, you've got a nice new baby. Enjoy him or her. And then something starts to go wrong. I will say to you, please think about this. This is what's going to help you guys if you start to focus on the truth. If something breaks down, there are very limited ways that can occur. A child can have congenital developmental issues, structural cellular but if they send your kid home healthy, those don't apply. Occasionally, a vascular malformation may show up later in life. And unfortunately, there can be an injury along the way. There can be tumors. These are all reasons for disease that show up later. And the truth is, there are metabolic diseases. We have a whole field out there, by the way, of mitochondrial disorders that we know are metabolic. But I would respectfully say to all of you, one is, those are very serious, bad diseases. If we could, when the body isn't working right, when the body has broken down metabolically, if we could throw things in there and make it work, don't you think we would have done that as doctors? The truth is, if something, I'm going to, you've got to understand this as parents. If something is not working in your child's body, you have to go after the problem. You don't win by going after secondary effects. And I will promise you, from loads of research, loads of conferences, this is not a metabolic illness in your children. So what are you left with? Infectious, 
We know, we were taught in medical school, herpes viruses love the temporal lobe of the brain. Maybe most of you don't know, but herpes is one of the only viruses that what we call DNA. Most things you think about, colds, flu, otherwise, they work out of the cytoplasm of your cells. Herpes goes to the nucleus. Very different. And of course, immunologic. And about the only nice words I would say about HIV is it did open the door to a huge amount of immune research that gave us new insights to the immune system. Now again, I stress, if you take away structural, your baby's born okay, goes home okay, there are only a very limited ways it can go wrong. And short of the catch term, well, it must be psychological, you're left with objective points. I was at a res think about this, all of you, because you've been living through the worst nightmare, I can tell you. I was at a research meeting. This was 96, 97. It was on social brain. It was top researchers from around the country, basically Alzheimer's down to autism. Now, some people know I get angry out there, but think about it, because this was told to me, 96 range. By the time we left that conference, these experts, the statement was, if a child developed normally, the first 12, 15, 18 months of life, had any words, then went into this A-word spectrum, 100% the process was going to be immune or viral. To show you how absolute that is, if a kid developed normally the first 12, 15, 18 months of life, had no words, went into this A-word spectrum, 99% it was immune or viral. And the key point, I stress this to you, is not one credible researcher there had another mechanism that could explain it. Once I was in my practice, it wasn't long before you started seeing kids and parents started coming in with symptoms or issues that I wasn't taught in medical school. I always used to enjoy joking that as mothers, if you read the fine print on the birth certificate, you're not allowed to get sick until your kids are 18. Now you have moms with migraines, allergies, asthma, chronic illness. This is a medical epidemic affecting adults and children. It's not just your children. And we started seeing children with mixed attention deficit, quiet ADD, none of this was described in medical school. My practice began to grow. Um, Instead of seeing newborns, I was starting to slowly see people with chronic fatigue, ADHD. I started working with Tourette's. This was mid-80s. I had never heard about Tourette's. Think about this, because this all ties into your children. A, a Dr. David Cummings is a world expert on Tourette's. He happens to be at Loma Linda by me. And I found out Tourette's essentially was non-existent before the 80s. There might have been a kid somewhere that got a, that, that fit that description. But as a disorder, it wasn't around. My colleagues made jokes that, hey, I'm not seeing these kind of people. I'm right across the street from you. I wish that was true. <laughs> Clinical patterns became obvious to me. A lot of what was going on with these labels were what I was used to working with children with allergies. However, unlike my experience of children with allergies, these adults and kids now had a neurocognitive dysfunction going on. This is what has changed in the last 25 to 30 years. Many people grew up with allergies, survived them, got through them. Now, as I will explain, you look at this, you add stresses together, we're going into a neurocognitive problem. Family histories of these children. 
repeatedly showed links of allergies, immune-mediated disorders, as I'll point out later, not developmental disorders. Now, what really changed things, in fact, my wife makes a joke that she got ill to change my career. <laughs> but in 1982, my soon-to-be wife developed this mysterious illness, debilitating, headaches, fatigue, fibromyalgia, swollen glands. And I want to try to convey today that I didn't come into this with autism. I lived through these years as, an L as a change in clinical medicine, but I still believe and respect the principles of biology, the principles of physiology have not changed. So I started trying to figure out what's wrong. Now, just like a lot of your kids ultimately, she had high viral titers, and that was the first learning lesson. Working with excellent infectious disease specialists. They didn't say to me, hey, your wife is crazy. These, t these titers don't mean anything. But what they did say was, it is not normal to walk around with multiple sky-high titers. So the key becomes her immune system. I literally consulted, again, as a doctor, I had the benefit. I talked to experts around the country. They, could have, they, they didn't help. And I will never forget this. He still kids me about it. But my son said, fix her yourself, Dad. <laughs> and that started my trek, just like you are fighting to help your children. My starting trek with, into this was to help my wife and other patients. But I've got a little advantage over all of you. I've been at this 28 years. Um, uh, we tried different things. Now again, unlike people may say, I'm, I'm trained believing in nutrition. I believe in, in, in foods and other issues. But I also learned you're not going to fix a disease nutritionally that doesn't start nutritionally. And even in my wife or an adult, there was never a right to give mega dosages of any substance because that could push the body in a way that wasn't going to work. Um, so, I realized, okay, I need to become the expert. Fortunately, in my training, as I say, I look back and I am thankful today for the professors, the education I received. And one of those professors was a Dr. Ben Kagan, who literally, as I tell people, I trained retrospectively with what are considered icons in pediatrics. He wrote textbooks. A Dr. Paul Worley at another program was a genius in infectious disease. A Dr. Bill St. Jim went on to lead other programs. So retrospectively, I'm very thankful I received a really good pediatric education. But perhaps reflecting my frustration, my wife went through, end of June, a seven and a half hour procedure for reconstructive breast surgery. And thankfully, she is a 10-year survivor. The surgeon, I go, I, I'm sitting there, and when you sit around for six and a half hours, you do a whole lot of thinking. And I'm pretty frustrated when I know what's going on. And I went up to the surgeon. He, first off, by the way, world we've entered, he had to fight for my wife to spend one night in a hospital. Think about that. Seven and a half hours on a table under anesthesia. Medically, you are not stable for 24 to 48 hours. But he had to fight for her to have one night there. This is the world we're entering. Let's cut all the corners we can, and hey, if something happens, we're sorry about it. No, not acceptable. But I went up to him and made a statement that I've said to others along the way, that I don't believe if my professors were alive today, they would be this dumb. You know what his statement was to me? And it's partly reinvigorated me in this fight. Mike, there's a reason they trained you. And what I'm hoping is I can convey to all of you that the answer for your children is going to get back to good pediatrics. Now, I went up to Dr. Kagan. I was looking with my wife 
at using amino acids. Again, I'm not opposed to nutritional ideas, but it was a very fast learning process. One is, you don't megadose. You can try to correct what's off. You can't megadose. And I realized, Dr. Kagan reinforced it, that if the body was low in what's called lysine, arginine, to you as parents, it would look really good to say, oh, look, your kid's low in arginine. Let's give them arginine. Learn real fast. Arginine feeds the herpes viruses. Maybe there's a reason your kids' bodies are trying the best they can to protect themselves. And, forgive me because many people know I'm opposed to most of the supplements and what's being done out there. Well, I'm not opposed to it for the sake of being opposed. It doesn't work. Dr. Kagan was a genius. He tried, he told, when I talked to him cautiously, because you have to remember, nutritional was really on the edge. So I went up to him like, my friend is thinking about this. <laughs> and Dr. Kagan spoke to me. But he told me, Mike, we tried to do this back in the 30s. The products couldn't get past the liver. Probably the biggest thing that protects your children from overdosing is they don't absorb most of what you give them. It's going in one end, out the other. <laughs> the truth is, over-the-counter meds, especially when it comes to any kind of amino acid or other things, are not going to be absorbed unless they are clean. The body reacts to impurities. I've made a statement many times. If you are going to give your kids any kind of a supplement, I don't agree with most, but let's take evening primrose oil. Learning lesson. Give omega-3, without a balance of 6 and 9, you're doing something wrong to your child. Give a balance, and it might help slightly. It's not going to fix anything. The kids didn't start this way because they were deficient on omega-3 or 6. But if you don't get a pharmaceutical-grade product, you might as well not get it at all because the normal stuff, the impurities, will make the body react more than help it. We're forgetting that nature tried to design our bodies to protect us. Now, by the late 80s, it was obvious. All of this stuff starting to happen must connect somewhere to what we were just starting to learn about, this neuroimmune system. Now, let me make it simple. The more we learn, the more complex it is. But what is neuroimmune? Think of yourselves. How do you feel when you get a cold? So me, spacey, tired, achy, miserable. Well, I'm thinking on a cold because a cold is a virus that cannot go to your brain. Why do you feel that way? That is how we were designed. This neuroimmune system shuts down blood flow to key areas of your brain, but in four or five days, a week later, you get well, it opens back up, you get back to normal. I'll explain this many times, but this is what's happening to your children. They're not being born with some weird disorder called A-word. They are certainly not being born with miswired brains. But for multiplicity of reasons, this neuroimmune system goes into a shutdown, and that's what you're dealing with. Now, in the middle of this, because again, I was looking, I was trying to figure out what's going on with my life. What's going on with these kids I'm seeing in the practice? A company I was working with sent me blood from a bunch of kids in West LA who they were evaluating for autism. To my shock at the time, they're testing the markers were completely similar to these adults with chronic fatigue, my wife, and other kids. Now, since I was already at the early stage of saying this must be neuroimmune, literally I went, what does autism have to do with the immune system? And that all led into a paper that's out there that you guys can get to called Autism and the Immune Connection. Now, Again, this has been a process. What I'm hoping to do today is save all of you from repeating the process. We have to get to work on your children now. 
not another decade or two. So for me, this all unfolded. I attended a research meeting early 1990. A Dr. Jay Goldstein had organized this, and you were starting to see doctors react to the idea that they were giving these adults, presenting the way I said, with the name chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, that was a very facetious name. It was really meant to say, you got a bunch of yuppies here complaining about a flu, but they're really making it up. I would argue if we had figured out what was wrong with those yuppies, your children would be well today. So I attended, the, I began to attend these conferences. A few years later, I was actually hosting it with him. And it was to my pleasure to meet some very brilliant, advanced researchers. Dr. Nancy Klimas, who is at University of Miami. Her focus is adults with chronic fatigue. But as my wife said, she was the first person, and she could do this, by the way. She can take and explain how the immune system does all this. She has that expertise. I meet Dr. Mena. He was a genius ahead of his time. He was doing neurospec. And all of a sudden, the neurospec started to make sense. What's working, not working in these children. So what came out of this, progressively, this was all unfolding, was we had some type of neuroimmune stress, whether this was an adult, teenager, child, it's a combination of stresses. This is what's been missed out there. You're not going to find one cause, one reason for what's happening to your children. What happens with this neuroimmune system, you put on stress after stress after stress, and somewhere <coughs> it becomes dysfunctional. As I try to tell many new families, as a pediatrician, I had loads of kids. Mothers had rough pregnancies. They had crass C-sections. They had horrendous deliveries. But if those kids weren't damaged, they grew up just fine. Your children, it's a combination of stresses, and somewhere they go into this neuroimmune system. Now, again, forgive me. Many people know I get frustrated, angry out there. This was a 1992 NIH meeting where they first acknowledged maybe some of these crazy adults were not really so crazy. We'll never forget this meeting. Some of them had low NK cells. And I will never forget this. If the NK cells are low, you're prone to bioactivation. Unfortunately, you're prone to cancer. And the mitochondria of the cells do not work right. Essentially, when the mitochondria of the cells are not working right, you can measure a hundred things in these adults and kids that are abnormal. But my position would be, if I tested all of you when you have the flu, I wonder how many abnormalities I would find. But those abnormalities have nothing to do with the reason or cause. If we're going to help your children, you've got to come back to reason and cause. As I noted before, they have motor issues. Some of them are even sensitive to heat. How many of you know that heat sensitivity is a classic marker for autoimmune diseases? Since when was a child supposed to be unusually sensitive to heat? Unfortunately, and I think this is part of the brain dysfunction, they become extremely picky eaters. But the whole key, what I want to lead you towards today, is they lose that brightness and sharpness of a child. I don't think I've met one new parent that when you go over the child's history, you can't go back to when they were a bright, alert little kid. You all have pictures and videos of that. And then that kid is lost. That's the medical problem. A healthy child must be bright and alert. And we'll come to this in therapy. Because all the therapies out there are not getting you what you need. I will argue when I talk to a parent, they'll often, right, I always ask a question. How do you consider your child? 
bright alert, Sony Spacey, Hyper, all of the above. <laughs> Most of them go, all of the above, are bright alert. And then I asked a very loaded question, because many of these parents have done different therapies, have tried different things. Does your child ever have the sparkle of a bright, healthy kid equivalent age? Uniformly, the answer is no. I will argue all of the therapies out, out there are not getting you what your children deserve and you deserve, a healthy kid. These children all have cognitive delays, and most of them have, obviously, speech and language issues. Now, think about what I'm saying. I'm praying that there's a way to get parents organized, that the world is mixed up out there. When was I ever taught in medical school that children were supposed to grow up photosensitive, noise sensitive, chronic pain, chronic rheumatoid symptoms, chronic headaches, anxiety, <coughs> panic attacks. This is, as I said, the exact opposite of how I trained in medical school. We were supposed to be entering a better era. We were going to help you raise healthy children. A kid that feels like that doesn't have a chance. As my wife said, if they feel one-tenth as bad as she did, I've got to do something. Now, after seven years of research, additional 18 months of a different treatment, my wife got well. This was another learning lesson. You treat this thing effectively, and what she told me, it was like a light switch in, the, in her body. She went from this sick person back to a healthy person. And as I will try to explain today, this whole 28 years has led into what we're now calling the Goldberg approach. And I would like to say that over the years, I, I will do and have done everything I think is reasonable from multiple conferences, but I will not do things that I know don't work and I will not do things that can hurt a child. Now, I went, I actually presented this. I was, I was getting into this, and I went to an ASA meeting, 1995. Last one I ever went to. <laughs> My wife's comment was, where are the doctors? Think about this. The trouble, the only justification I'll give for why your kids are here today is this is a field that started with psychiatry. PhDs, not MDs. Everything that was cognitive, everything that was learning disorders was not our job as a doctor. Now, if your child was ever affectionate, for the record, I've yet to meet a family who says their child wasn't. If your child was affectionate, this literally excludes your child from Dr. Kerner's autism. What the professors, the experts out there are not discussing is let's go back to the 50s. When Dr. Kerner, he's the expert, he's the one that came up with this. When he was asked what separated a child with this new idea of autism, from childhood schizophrenia, remember, it was all psychological, it was not medical. His statement was, the child with autism was never affectionate. Now, if I go by that, I really believe there may be one or two children per 10,000 out there that may have something really strange that Dr. Canner called autism, but your children do not fit it. The quicker we get rid of the term autism, the faster all of you have a chance to get the help you need for your children. Now, as I've stated, we've gone from a rare kid who nobody knew what was wrong to where the kids are coming out of the woodwork. And what's the truth? There's not one real test for autism. There's not one test to prove your kids have autism. So in a sense, part of where you're trapped is we've made an academic system that's built around autism, and instead, there's no proof of that. See what we're doing? You're all convinced you have autism, all objective reasoning goes out the window, and yet I will say 
The chance for all of you is let's get back to demanding logic and science. Look at this. People, again, are studying genetics. This is, this is data out there. Genetic disorders that were associated with autism haven't changed at all. So how do we explain that mysteriously your kids' genes are changing, but nobody else's are? Look at this. Again, all disabilities have remained where they've been. Autism is skyrocketing. I actually hate using the word autism. Please understand every time I say it, I don't believe your children have autism. Autistic would be a better way of saying it. If you look at their dysfunction, they have a group of autistic symptoms, but there's no way in life a developmental disability can grow like that. Now, let's go back to medical school. Again, I didn't train in the 1700s. Somebody said I'm old school. Well, you know what? If old school meant logic, science, and knowing what you're doing, I'm proud to say I'm old school. But I also think I changed over the years and evolved. But the basic principles don't change. There has to be a reason, and there has to be an explanation. And a simple starting point that the, that the academic world is choosing to ignore is basic science 101. You cannot have an epidemic of a genetic or developmental disorder. You guys can all check, go back to, you know, any kind of genetic classes you studied in school. Guarantee you there's no exception to that. So with this crisis, greater than 1% of your children, forgive me, but there's no excuse anymore. The people in charge should be changing what they're doing. Are bluntly, you need other people in charge. Now think about this. I grew up, date myself, in the 50s. I remember my next door neighbor was a family practitioner. I remember one year going next door, getting a shot. And I remember the next year getting these little sugar cubes. Now, how many of you know that when my mom was terrified, every spring, would a kid get this illness, possibly die, possibly be paralyzed. Polio at its worst was 1 in 1,500 to 2,000 children. Your kids are multitudes of that, and we're not approaching it like a disease. If we threw the switch, call it a disease, every resource would change, and the help for your children would change enormously. Now, to understand this, why am I putting this slide up there? I'm talking about a medical epidemic. You have to realize we have, a, we have a way of repeating history. Over the years, this was very interesting to me because obviously I was not taught this in medical school, there were these weird outbreaks where people acted cognitively dysfunctional, tired, exhausted, no obvious medical reason. So, of course, it gets brained on psychiatry, neurothenia, I mean, names that meant basically no reason, it just happened. But the key, and this is a key to understanding your children, these outbreaks occurred over years. But starting in the early 80s, one after another, Japan came out with something called the low end case syndrome. No known virus, no known bacteria, but isn't it interesting that what I said to you was a hallmark of this in adults and your children was low end case cells. The outbreak at Tahoe, outbreak around the world, and right in Lindenville, New York, Dr. David Bell was working with children. Since when? do children get psychosomatic complaints and illnesses? We should have been scrambling to figure this out, and instead it was all put to the side. <coughs> now let's look at something. I want, again, I, I, this is an important concept for all of you. An adult who's developed, they went to college, they have intelligent brains, 
they were not born with some kind of weird, unexplained disorder. But they become dysfunctional. Look at the characteristics. A kid with a word has trouble, obviously, physical, social language, abnormal responses to sensations, ways the body's affected, speech and language issues, abnormal ways of relating to people. But look at this previously intelligent adult. Distressing memory, concentration loss, can't find the right word to say, fogginess, forgetfulness, overwhelmed by loud noises. Think of your children. If this can happen to an adult, what's happening to your child? They previously intelligent person had impaired judgment, dyslexic-like symptoms, difficulty maintaining attention, and difficulties in, in retrieving and encoding information. How much of that applies to your children? And really means, again, they have a disease. They don't have whatever we want to call Dr. Cantor autism. So, what I'm going to try to lead you to, and I'm, again, at this point I am really, literally praying that enough of you as parents could come together. And, and the joke was, when I was growing up in L.A., the joke was the South would rise again. <laughs> well, the South has done pretty good. You guys have, have really built up. But it'd be nice to see a, see a true evolution start. Okay? Um, the only thing that makes sense is that we are in the middle of a medical epidemic that we have failed to address. Now, I'll explain that to you in a moment. I believe the reasons we have not addressed this has been some very, very bad mistakes. We're here in Atlanta. The CDC is here. Realistically, I'm, I want academics to change. I believe if the CDC, Emory <coughs> University, and others realized we have a medical epidemic, they would put all their resources into how do you get this solved and how do you make people healthy. But the mistake was Experts from the CDC came out to this epidemic in Lake Tahoe, could not find, now think about this, because I try to justify that this at least explains what they did. We thought, again, we knew everything. By the time we were in the 70s, we knew the viruses, we knew the bacteria, we knew the reasons for disease. And medicine was oriented, what's the pathogen? So these experts come out to Lake Tahoe. It's obvious very quickly that there is no single pathogen. So instead of doing what thankfully top experts told me about my wife, well, it's not, something's wrong with her. She's not making it up. The viral titers should not be this high. The CDC people basically started what has completely changed medicine today Viral titers don't mean anything. They ignored the immune markings. And unfortunately, because this was adults, it of course became psychosomatic. We all know that all adults are psychosomatic, right? I was never told that was true for children. So, when I trained in medical school, I go back to it because this is not, this is, this was, very advanced. It wasn't old science. If a titer went up fourfold, that was evidence that you had been exposed to that virus or you had it. 1984, we decided high titers don't mean anything. I know physicians who trained in the 80s and 90s and they don't even look at viruses. How can we diagnose what's wrong with your children if the only way to prove a virus would be to stick a needle in the brain, how many people are going to do that? So we better reevaluate what we're doing. And this is medical school 101. You would get a vaccine, or you get a virus, you would mount this high titer, and then the key is it went down to a low number. That's how a vaccine protects you. That's how, a, how your body learns to fight the virus. You remember it. So you're ready to gear up when it happens again. In this case, my wife, 
other adults are walking around with tighter sky high. If at that time we had said it isn't Epstein-Barr or it isn't the virus we're saying, but it must be something wrong, I really believe your children would be well today. So, here I am going through this journey. Evidence is pointing over and over to immune system. And then I had the great privilege, as I said, of meeting Dr. Mena, working with the Dr. Bruce Miller. I will never forget the day I met Dr. Miller. At that point, we were up to 33 scans in my practice. I might comment, we got up to 130 and stopped counting. I went to see him. He took these 33 scans, shuffled them like a deck of cards, mild, moderate, severe and could tell me sight unseen was working and not working in these children. Why isn't that technology being used for your children today? And what became obvious, and this was the real bulb going off, the real connection, was these adults, these atypical ADDs, all had temporal lobe hypoperfusion. That gets into this neuroimmune system shutting down blood flow to key areas of the brain. What became obvious was, wait a minute, these quote-unquote A-word kids had the same finding. Consistently, neuroimmune shutdown. And even Dr. Miller made a statement. This man's a genius by way of adult dementia. Mike, whatever this is, it is incompatible with any previous idea of autism. Please remember that. And it turns out, as I got literally a new education in neurology, I didn't start off as a neurologist, right temporal lobe, social skills, left temporal lobe, auditory processing and language. It's no mystery. Now, on a scan, this is where we've evolved to. This is a summary scan. We're now in a position that we can take a child's data, and this is because of Dr. Maynard. We may be the only group in the, in the world that has a normal database. For the record, you can't do normal studies anymore. But Dr. Mena put this together over years, and he was able to do normal studies in another country. So we have a very accurate database. And what you see with Neurospec, perhaps one of the mistakes out there, people have read Neurospec and said it shows this or proves this. That's immediately wrong. The only thing a spec scan can prove is what areas are working and not working. I will grant you there are patterns. Dr. Mena could look at a scan and says, hey, I think this might be aut autism or it might be ADD. But the scan doesn't prove that. But the scan does tell you what's working. Green areas you see here, again, this is imposing this child's data on a normal database. If everything was normal, the whole brain would be great. In this case, green or blue, is too little function, red or white is too much. I would tell you over all these years, the simple point I learned is our brains have to be balanced. It doesn't work right when something's too low, and it actually doesn't work right when something's too high. Now, we evolved to a point that you can use a scan, and as I said, Dr. Miller could do this instantly, and you can actually pinpoint the areas of the brain that are working not working. This is 21st century technology. Why are we not applying that to your children? So, with the idea that within this practice, this had to be an immune dysfunction, again, through multiple consult studies, meetings, the only answer was infectious or autoimmune, and it said that there had to be, and this is getting, this gets a little scary, Immune dysfunction, CNS dysregulation, and genetically predisposed individuals. Now that means, if I want to argue it, yes, there is a genetic component. But that genetic component is going to be multifactorial, which is what many studies are admitting. What's scary is when, it, when they figure it out, the genes involved are going to tie into IQ, and probably immune. Almost everything they reported, you can explain via immune. 
Now, what gets really scary, and I'm hoping, again, if we get the truth out there, people will say, let's do something, is we may be in the middle of some type of human evolution. I train excellent pediatrics, but I will bluntly say these kids are smarter than what I was taught in school and how I trained. Many of you know this. Your quote-unquote A-word kid started off brighter than the brother or sister. Where would you all be today if the system didn't have this idea that, well, you just don't understand it, but your kid's been damaged, your kid's injured, you can't do anything. What if we said, wait a minute, we're losing our future college graduates, our future leaders. That's how these kids start off. And it's time to get a battle as moms that your children deserve a medical focus to figure this out before we lose them all. Now, it became obvious, and this is what I think you have to look at. The medical world, and this is what's going to happen when we talk about immune autism, they're going to study every little piece of that immune system. It'll make the research network wealthy, but we need to put the dots together and fix your kids while we do the studies, not after. So what I look at here is we coined the term NIDS, Neuroimmune Dysfunction Syndromes. What I said a long time ago, you could call it ABCD syndrome for all I cared then, but the truth is NIDS is catching on because when you look how medicine does things, when we didn't understand a disorder, we named it by its characteristics. This is a neuroimmune dysfunction. Now what I did when I, when I came up with that with other researchers was the goal was to bring back cognitive dysfunction to the medical field. I said to you that autism, ADD, LD, anything was under psychiatry. Well, if we have a critical medical epidemic, let's figure out a way to study this under the medical system. Now, it became obvious, whether you look at genetics, environmental, viruses, vaccines do trigger some of your kids as an insult, but they're never going to be the stress or the cause. And other immune system insults, what I show parents all the time, how many kids have constant eczema, constant allergies, and then someone tells you, well, look, the vaccine did this to your kid. And that's kept you as mothers very upset. Well, I've yet to see a child that you couldn't see kind of already with stresses falling into the slope, and then the vaccine might have aggravated that. But I've yet to see a new patient that was totally fine and the vaccine ever caused it. My argument back in the mid-90s was I had an excellent infectious disease training. If a disease as severe as measles, polio, couldn't cause autism, then in honesty, there's no way a vaccine can do it. Think about it. Um, and, I'm, and again, what you have to stay is open to what combination of stresses puts you into this immune shutdown. But if we recognize your children have a disease, we can deal with fixing it while we study all the stresses. The children present with symptomatology, learning difficulties, Involvements that reflect the temporal lobes of the brain. As I said to you, many of your children today have gross of fine motor abnormalities. Some children even have hypotonia. Any child with a motor issue shouldn't be called autism. Let's start with the fact your kids have something wrong. What is it? Okay? Many of these children have OCD characteristics. Two learning lessons. One is a Dr. Susan Swaylow, NIH, came up with something called PANDAS. This was the idea of a strep-induced OCD. Now, I'll be honest with you, when that happened, I was smiling. I'm saying, wait a minute, they're waking up out there. How can a strep somewhere in the body make you act OCD? Well, unfortunately, using old techniques, they're still fighting about it 15 years later. But the other point talked to me by, talked to me by Dr. Miller is you don't need a strep to be OCD. With your children and adults, 
if what he explained is if you have a dysfunction between part of the frontal lobe, part of the temporal lobe, you act OCD. So every kid that's OCD is not pandas. But pandas is a real thing out there. Now, this gets into what I tried to point out to you. Let's go back to medical school and teaching. We learned asthma. You're born with some genetic predisposition. We don't say those kids are born, you know, pre-damaged, pre-injured. They have some kind of a disposition. But then it takes a combination of stresses. It could be emotional, it could be allergies, it could be disease, but somewhere they cross a line and they wheeze. Now, if we understand that in medicine, why can't we make the next jump? If the NIH could say in 1992 that this neuroimmune system was a combination of stresses, this is what's happening to your children. Whether they're stressed at birth, loads of food allergies, illnesses, recurrent ear infections, recurrent sinuses. Yes, I will tell you there may be a genetic disposition, but it's not a genetic disorder. Vaccines given when a kid's sick may be a stress. But you put this together, and you cross over that edge. It's explainable. It's not a mystery. It's real. So, literally, and again, what I'm hoping to do today is get most of you to realize where the medical system is misdirected, it could potentially change. It will listen to logic. It will not listen, as I learned over the years, to any stupidity. I stuck, you know, I never do it. I stuck my neck out. <laughs> at a research meeting, this was heavy duty, NIH, um, very high level, and I made a statement that if you started to look at this, this was 96 by the way, so think about again when I express my frustration to where I'm at. I made this statement, if you were an adolescent or adult and this neuroimmune process hit you, you had basically chronic fatigue syndrome, what they were now talking about with adults, ADHD variants, are what we frequently hear lately is, well, they have a typical lupus or they have an atypical MS. Now, if this happens to an older child, relatively mature brain, relatively mature immune system, you got variants of ADD, chronic fatigue possible. If it happened to a younger child, an infant, you got, quote unquote, autism. In that audience, not only did nobody laugh at me, and believe me, I was nervous as I said that, but a couple of years later, they were all coming up to me and saying, Mike, you're making a lot of sense. Now, this is 96, 98. Why are we in 2011, and the focus is still autism, a developmental disorder? Now, Lots of people stand in front of you and other groups around the country and they tell you things. And as I've had many, many parents say to me, how are they supposed to know who to believe? People stand up here and give you great stories to make their case. But my argument is, there's nothing that I'm going to say to you that you can't find other support in the literature, short of maybe the argument about viral titers. There's nothing I'm saying that isn't supportable. This is what you need to demand as parents. If somebody tells you something's causing this in your kids, where's the science? Where's the physiology? Where's the biology that explains that? And if they can't produce it, it isn't real. Unfortunately, I didn't used to say this, but I'm open. again, I look at this as either we're going to change things or you're all in trouble. I was at the original Dan conference in 1995 in Dallas. I'd never done anything with Dan after that because I realized it was not going to work. I was there when they essentially put together what I call this very convoluted diagram. How many of you have seen this diagram where the arrows go everywhere, the peptides go to the brain? You know what I'm talking about. Now ask yourself a question. If at that conference, Dr. Gupta, board certified adult immunology, NIH caliber professor, goes up to the board. Now this is 1995, 
cross that whole picture out with brain immune system, how can any therapist basing decisions on that picture be right? Do you get it? You, you, the, 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 they heard the truth and they didn't want to acknowledge it because it would have changed all of their livelihoods and business. But the truth is, it's time to change that. Your children are children. They are not being born injured. And we have to get back to the truth. Neuroimmune. So there's evidence that supports all that. Once this gets going, as I said, you may have an autoimmune reaction. But the key, the, the, the switch I hope will happen for all of you, the minute you come together, this has to be parents. Right now, the bad message to me as a doctor is for whatever the reasons, the medical system is going to chase autism, now immune. Alternative medicine is going to do what they want to do for years. And they were doing this, by the way, originally to adults with chronic fatigue. They're not doing anything new to your children that wasn't done to those adults. And I'll be very blunt. They were almost out of business because the adults had realized it wasn't working, it wasn't helping, and then along come your children. And the key is they have a dysregulated system. It's not broken. It can be fixed. Now, whether this pathway keeps going because there's a virus or a retrovirus, which is becoming far more likely, the truth is, research needs to be done. We need to understand this. The more we learn, the more complex it becomes. But we need to get to an urgency, just like polio, measles. We need to focus on treating your children while the system does all of its studies, not 20 years from now. Now, I've been involved in efforts. You can tell I've been in a different path. Again, with apologies, because people know I get angry out there. How do you think I feel? I've been trying for a number of times to literally at first backdoor the children into adult protocols that we're going to look at new immune agents. First, I had to beg the people in charge to give me a chance, give me a chance to prove the kids deserve a chance. And then this article came out. This is from Johns Hopkins. They did the most objective study on your children you could name. Remember I said everything on A word is subjective? Well, these researchers took brains, the way we do things in med medicine, children who passed away for other reasons, automobile accidents, <coughs> drowning, and they analyzed it. And they came out with the fact that there was a neuro, that the process they were seeing resembled Alzheimer's, Parkinson, ALS, much more than anything called autism. They recognized, this is now repeated the last five years multiple times, not by autopsy, but by findings, chronic microglial activation. The key point, and I'll come back to this, the other reason a lot of supplements and stuff don't work is once this neuroimmune system is doing its thing, it's being controlled by what we call the innate system in the brain. If there was an insult, if there was a toxicity, if there was this or was that, it doesn't matter anymore. The system is doing its thing inappropriately. But this article, this was 1995, 2005, excuse me, that made such a difference that the researchers I was with said, Mike, we can get you to the FDA. Now again, how do you think I feel when you're watching the academic world go around in circles, studying genetics, you're watching alternative medicine do their thing, and yet if we had been able to get the funding to do it, we had a clear path to the FDA looking at neuroimmune. What I'm saying to all of you, the academic system may be wrong, but it can come around. You don't beat that system by crazy or different ideas. You beat it 
at its own game. You do the work, you do the data, you prove your point. That's how the system can change. Now, I gave you handouts, and please, you know, I hope you all see them. I gave one set of handouts that has a bunch of, like, slides with reference points in them, and some of my comments. These are, these are items over a number of years. And my wife, who helps me a lot, I could not do this without her help. She, I said, see what's going on, autism immune? She downloads 20 pages in the last year. Now, here's part of your problem as parents, though. I gave you 12 of those pages. That says about 40% of what she downloaded either didn't apply or was bogus. Part of medical school, we learn how to read literature. You learn how to read data. You, you learn to sort out, hopefully, the wrong things. Now, the sad part is you guys weren't supposed to go to medical school. The pediatricians are supposed to help you. But data can be manipulated. I attended a meeting at Children's Hospital, and a researcher was presenting. Essentially, he had done what we call a chi-square analysis. You, you, you do across the top, you do it on the side. You know what the common denominator for autism was? All the mothers took prenatal vitamins. <laughs> See how data can be manipulated? You gotta read through what's being said. And in the end, see if it makes any sense. And I will argue the only thing that keeps making sense through all those articles is immune system. But, and I want to read, <coughs> and I read you that earlier. How do your children have a chance when every academic paper uses neurodevelopmental disorder? Think about that. Um, now, many of the papers show our components high, our components low, but the key again is the innate immune system. You're not going to fix what's high or low if you don't go after the system. And that, by the way, is what I'm hoping will not happen for your children. As they talk immune, you're going to watch a replay of 15, 20 years of research in immune. Well, it's very interesting. I went to a, again, I've lived all these years. I went to a research meeting. 1996 again. It was the, one of the first meetings on what we called chemokines, cytokines, the early days of talking about IL this, IL that, and a learning lesson has not changed. At that first, at, in essence, the first recognition, learn. Let's say you're high in IL-6. Are you high in IL-10? Wouldn't it be logical to say we're going to give you anti-IL-6? Our anti-IL-10, key learning point, do that and something else goes wrong in the body. You can't push one piece and not cause a problem. And by the way, to validate that, take a look at all of the new rheumatoid drugs that have come out based on immune system, and they all happen to carry a little warning. Might cause cancer, might cause TB, you can't, it, it's an old rule. When I grew up, it was like you don't play with Mother Nature. In this case, I will argue, you don't play with the immune system. We have to get to the understanding and logic that you have to balance the system, not push it one way or the other. The readouts give you multiple discussions of genetic markers, but as I said, if you look at them, they point to immune system. There are papers in there that basically admit it's a non-genetic etiology. Over and over, immune-stressed infants. The papers note, MMR may be an influence, may be a stress, not causation. Now, now let me really hit this for you guys. Because of my training, I knew measles, polio, diseases like that couldn't cause a wound. But you've all been told, vaccines. Unfortunately, the Academy, and this has just come out the last couple of days, they're trying to tell all of you, you don't have to worry. So you're caught in a world that says, oh, you don't have to worry, but you know there's a worry. And you're caught in a world that says, don't give vaccines. 
Now, if you don't give vaccines, you're going to unfortunately have the very unpleasant situation of watching some children or families get real measles, maybe real polio. There's been measles outbreaks around the world. California had an outbreak of whooping cough, pertussis. I trained. You want to see a kid gasping for breath and whooping away? So what we need to do is not throw out vaccines. They're the choices of them protect your children from very serious illnesses. But we need to get to our reality. Your children are ill, you help them get healthy, and then the vaccines can be effective. More evidence. This is the other big thing that's now taking over. Mitochondrial disease. How many of you have heard of mitochondrial? Now, please consider what I said earlier. This has been 28 years in adults. They chased mitochondrial. It was investigated. It kept coming back. It wasn't the reason. So why do we want to waste more time chasing it in your children? The truth goes into what I said. When the immune system is off, the mitochondria don't work right. I'm not going to fix anything going after the mitochondria. I've got to go after the immune system. And given the dangers, okay, think about this. I said this earlier, but you've got to remember this. We have real mitochondrial diseases. They are bad guys. People are miserable. If we could throw things in and fix that, don't you think medicine would have? What we know is when the system isn't working right and you throw something in, it's going to push something else the wrong way. It's not going to fix what you're trying to do. And in these studies I gave you, they even note that it may be a downstream. That's what I'm saying. Now, as the immune system is off, the mitochondrial system is downstream. It's not the reason. It's not the cause. Now, this is the other part. I'm hoping, I'd like this to be the start of it. If we keep approaching a word, like it's a word, you look at the literature, None of the papers talk about getting you a well child. None of them talk about recovering cognition. They talk about behavior control. They talk about intervention. Let's get to the truth. If it's an illness, we need to start talking recovery. And that is literally a 180 degree shift in our thinking. How many of your children have abnormal EEGs? Okay, think about it. That had nothing to do with Dr. Cannell autism. Abnormal EEGs have to do with the brain, the immune system, viruses. Many of your children have slowing on EEG. Slowing, when I was trained, was a classic marker for encephalopathy. The difference is the system, some of the consultants will go, Child has an encephalopathy, but what they don't understand is not passive, it's not old, it's slowly ongoing. That would change everything. And by the way, as I make a point, go back to, I keep going back to literature because that's your way of bringing your children back to science. If Dr. Canner didn't discuss seizures, they were basically non-existent, I really came into the A word, early mid 90s, when a good neurologist, pediatric neurologist, doesn't know, I didn't know what Landau Kleffner was. I pride myself, I usually try to know things. So I go up to a pediatric neurologist friend. He didn't know what it was. If something was that rare, and we're now saying 35, 40% of your children have seizures, could you remotely imagine the difference you would be living with? If this medical world realized we better fix this, not just accept it. <coughs> so, the other key, and this is what you need to do, if we're going to start a movement that says fix your children. As I said, when researchers come up here and give you their ideas, go to the literature. What you're going to find is there's zero support for other abnormalities in your children. The whole discussion is immune, viruses, 
and of course, lots of genetic studies. So be careful. I've already said this to you. When you read an article, you have to also know how to read through it a little bit. But I will argue, and over and over again, there is a complete lack of medical research supporting anything you want to call biomedical or medical, or metabolic. Now, the key, you read that literature, it's all sorts of markers. If we keep studying it, none of your children have one marker. That I've been in meetings where they wanted me to say, give us one test to prove your kids have autoimmune. Well, guess what? We don't have one test that proves everybody has lupus. If someone has a positive ANA, they may have lupus, but there's lots of other adults and stuff we know have diseases, autoimmune, and there's no single marker. So the key to this is to understand all these markers point to immune system. We're not going to solve this by studying little pieces. Again, in those efforts I was involved in, in hopes to get your children to the FDA, we were going to have to burn cash. We were going to do a blanket study of all of the markers in the kids. That's a lot of money. And then we knew out of that we would get patterns. And those patterns would help to tell us who should be treated in what way. If we don't start thinking that way, there's going to be a whole lot of studies, but there won't be a straight answer to you. And the key to this remains. The system is dysfunctional, it's not broken. Raising or lowering something isn't what's going to fix it. Now, we're using the term more and more. The more you learn, <coughs> complex neuroimmune, complex viral. We, you, the, the idea out there that you're told is we're going to throw all these things in your kid and they're going to strengthen the system. Well, if that was happening, this is 15, 20 years of crisis. Don't you think there'd be a whole lot of parents walking around saying, oh, my kid is recovered and well? Where are they? For the record, I spoke at, and I don't normally do this, I spoke at a conference that was attended by a lot of dad um, doctors. They had this statement, oh, go on my website. You can see all these recovered children. Now, forgive me, I'm being blunt. You're being lied to as parents. In pediatrics, a healthy child has to have that bright look in their eyes. My wife could pick all the kids out on the sites because they all had dark circles. That child may be recovered in terms of a word, what we taught was Rain Man, but they're not recovered at all in terms of disease or illness. And again, the mistake is this you can't push one way without pushing something else off. This is the key. The more we learn, the more complex it becomes. We started off with Th1, we now have Th2, Th3, but the mistake, and let me see if I can point this out to you because this is a key to understand. This is supposed to work. There we go. This is how I was taught in medical school. If you have an immune disease, something is either low, something is high. I've actually had parents go to immunologists, and it's very interesting what's happening. It's either they work the child up for classical diseases, your kids don't have that, or in California we've gotten to a point that the immunologists are now telling the parents, oh, all your kids have immune abnormalities. When did that get acceptable? You know, from saying the kids don't have immune, now it's every one of your kids has immune. That's not autism. So the, the thing that's fooling the experts, so is when you look at this, this is what we were not taught about. As I said to you, if you go back to the start of the 80s, disease change, partly in defense of the CDC. We were always taught to think like the first part. You're well, you're ill. Something's off, high, low. If you realize that whatever changed environmentally in our world, you now have a bunch of adults and children starting with stressed immune systems. What we have failed to recognize in academic medicine is if the immune system is stressed, you're not going to get an acute viral infection, 
you're going to get a chronic viral infection. We have completely failed to understand the difference of disease presentation in these adults and children. But the key is, oops, there we go. This is like nothing that we were ever taught about. Unlike these diseases, part of the body is elevated, part of it is depressed. Take a look at what happens. If you've given stuff to your child to raise the depressed area, you're going to overshoot the good area. The immune system then causes more harm to a child. I'll show you that in a moment. And if you suppress this, you're going to really suppress the low area, and that's going to throw the child off. So the concept here, again, is new in thinking. But we have to get to a recognition it's not a broken system. It's a dysfunctional system. And you have to look at tools that will balance it not push it one way or the other. Now, I, I already said this, so I'll skip over it, but again, people tell you mitochondrial disease is a cause. Please remember this, it's secondary. It will never be a primary reason. Now, beyond my concerns as a pediatrician over the years, essentially because I'm a pediatrician, because I trained in children, I never bought that chelation, h plot was safe. My training was mega supplements are dangerous. How many of you are told, again, this was like first lesson in pediatrics, a premature child needs oxygen, right? But if you give them too much oxygen, they go blind. Oxygen is a toxic radical. Nobody has a right to tell you it's safe in your children unless they suffered hypoxia and there's a rare indication that H, that H bond is considered. The other risk coming up, and this had gone back from the early 80s in adults, along the workups on adults and now on your children, is coming the issue of are we looking at retroviruses? Retroviruses are far more inflammatory, they're far more dangerous, and at a research meeting I was at, think about this a moment, because again, our system wants to fight one fight People came out and said XMRV might be a cause of this in chronic fatigue. The whole system mobilized to say it wasn't XMRV. But at research meetings, I had very high-powered researchers from the National Institute of Science, National Institute of Cancer, tease me. Mike, how many new pathogens have we discovered in the last 30 years? I go, I don't know. The answer was 90 three per year, and of that three per year, 58 or more are retroviruses. If we don't start focusing on getting our immune systems healthy, believe me, there are not going to be enough specific tools, our time and research, to figure out each one. Now, this gets into what I've led you towards. We're looking at a different disease. Instead of being an acute herpes infection, an acute HHV6, you're looking at chronic activation. Now, this is probably the closest to the truth you're going to come. Think about this in a moment. The argument is we live in a sea of viruses. They're all around us. The argument about herpes viruses is over millennium we may have incorporated them into our DNA. Remember, herpes is a nucleus, DNA virus. So, the, the logic is, whenever your immune system gets stressed enough, these viruses can reactivate. But that's not what we were taught in medical school. We were taught to think of infection, not activation. Now, also, confusing everybody, we've now learned about HHV6, HHV7, and HHV8. These actually eight are the causes of roseola, by the way, in children. So we didn't know that then, but we now know that. But guess what? Herpes simplex, cold sores, vaginal sores. Remember herpes simplex is a very virulent, but somewhat foolish virus. If it attacks you, gets to your brain, you're going to be comatose, you're going to be in a hospital, and you're literally going to live or die in a very short amount of time. Now, HHV6, 7, and 8 are much smarter viruses. 
they go to the brain, but they smolder low grade. Let's keep the host alive, and then I can stay alive. The only problem is I've never read anything in the literature that says a virus living on my brain was good for me. So we got a problem. <coughs> now, again, the idea of these retroviruses makes all of this more complex. But it also means we, we need to solve this. I come back to what I said to you, find gross motor abnormalities, abnormal EEGs, and all of this is secondary to the immune system. Errors in therapy. There are many out there, anecdotal reports of successful therapies using, turns out, agents that affect the immune system. Gamma globulin, allergy-free diets. As I said, though, out of all that's being done, it's very rare to get that child that's fully bright, fully alert. It has happened, but it's very rare out there. Now, what we have to do is start thinking of what I'm saying many times to you, balance, restoring a healthy balance, and literally can, trying to control your children, chelate, megadose, overoxygenate, is never going to be safe. This is the scan of a child that was doing gluten-free, casein-free, and chelation. I can honestly say to you, having worked with many children, many scans, I never saw white hot areas like this until looking at children who've done these things. And if you take a look, I talked about temporal lobes. I talked about frontal lobes. There's abnormalities here in parts of the brain that were always normal on our studies. The point that you're all being misled on is when you do a general therapy to your children, that doesn't get directed to the temporal lobe of the brain. It's affecting the whole body and brain. And what became very scary when I was doing research in the seizure issues is there is data that, think about this a moment, you give a little old mouse or rat a chemical that irritates the GI tract the immune system attacks the brain and makes it more vulnerable to a seizure. What you're looking at is multiple attacks on this patient. Whoops, I'm sorry. Okay, that are the system attacking. Now, this is a child that did glutathione, HBOT chelation. Look at this. This should never happen. I got, we got up to 133 scans. And this was mid-90s before all the alternative medicine. And I can say to you consistently, low temporal lo low blood flow. Some children had too much flow in the frontal lobes. But the key is the occipital parietal lobes were normal. If you read other spec reports out there, a Dr. Munz here at University of Alabama did studies back, back in the um, mid-90s. He reported what we did. Temporal lobe, some frontal lobe, nothing like this affecting that. Now, unfortunately, this child has seizures. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to understand that if I'm literally over, over, over stimulating that brain, how long before it fires off the seizure? I'm going to do something that I've never done before. This is not in your hand. If, I'll make this information available to Sarah and Rosalind, and then you guys can get it formally. But I'm presenting you with a neural spec challenge. There are plenty of parents who know academics isn't helping. Unfortunately, there are many, many parents who believe, in spite of the logic, that the alternative medicine is helping their children. If you're one of them, it's time you looked at your child's brain. This, there's a center in Florida, 
Dr. Usler gets the data, so it goes into our database, and they have agreed to give everybody a 10% discount. But my comment to you is, hopefully what I'm presenting will be strong enough to get you to understand. You don't want to do things that can hurt your children. I don't believe in any way they're pre-injured or pre-broken in any way. But the data is saying what's being done is hurting them. Now, as I've alluded to, I'll try to go a little faster. I want to leave you guys time for questions. But many children are now having seizures. I don't buy their idiopathic. And there's a huge amount of literature that supports herpes viruses in the brain. Now, if we're saying to you that titers don't mean anything, how are you going to diagnose that except put a needle in the brain? So all your kids are considered idiopathic. Isn't it interesting that when I went to peer-reviewed literature, on autopsy, 25%, you could extrapolate that to as many as 40%, of children with generalized seizures, temporal lobe seizures, had herpes in the brain. So ask yourself, so I asked myself a question. If I was a pediatric neurologist, how could I sit in an office doing a consult and tell a parent it's idiopathic when I'm automatically missing at least 25% or more? Now, the other thing that showed up in your children, this all keeps coming into, we got a medical condition. Many of your children are having weird thyroid issues, growth issues. Well, guess what? It's explainable. It's not a mystery. If you look at the SPEC scan, you have this shutdown of the neuroimmune system. I keep saying temporal lobe. This area sits on top of what we're taught in medical school is the hypothalamic pituitary axis. So you're throwing off function. Now, it's very interesting. Again, for me, this goes over many, many years. I talked to pediatric endocrinologists 2004-2005. I made a lot of sense to them because they were seeing children that didn't give them typical thyroid issue, typical growth hormone issue. But now when you start to explain dysfunction, instead of broken, it made sense. The other critical point is unfortunately, a lot of your children are having growth issues. The key, if your child really is having a problem, it has become obvious. If you do a normal screening, what we call a static test, it will often be normal. If you go to a pediatric endocrinologist, you need them to do a challenge. If the challenge is normal, wonderful. But the challenge will often be abnormal. What do all of you do in the meantime? My hope is, I'm being honest, I want to unite a revolution in this country. Start with the South here. Let's get mothers saying the truth. Your children are ill. They do not have counter autism. Now we want you to come up with a reason. See? If you talk to the medical profession and we take the right stand, there, I know this. I know this from work I've been involved in. There are multiple pediatric immunologists, infectious disease people, who would love to study your children. They don't get funded. It's going everywhere but to them. So medical school lesson, pediatric 101, listen to the mothers. How many of you know your child was born normal, was fine up to a point, and then something went wrong? How many of you know that? How many of you believe your child has a disease? Stick to it. Those of you that do are right. And, you, and, and no matter what someone says to you, your instincts as a mother right now are more effective than the experts. Your children are ill. Let's get a focus that goes after that. You cannot win a fight the way we've set it up out there. This is, by the way, I get angry because this is not how I trained in medicine, as I'm pointing out to you. We all train the academic world. The ivory towers were the answer. Well, mid-90s, A-word hits, 
parents raise lots of money, goes to the ivory towers, and instead of fixing everything, they just expanded a basket called Aylward. Alternatively, the alternative medicine people are doing what they've done for 30, 40 years, but now they have a whole desperate group of parents and kids, and they're not going to fix it. So my hope is, let's create option C. You demand a medical system that is logical, academic, but approaches your children for what they are. They are ill. They deserve the same focus, the same help that our parents got back in the 40s and 50s. It's time, and you have to, I can't say this strong enough, you cannot win either of those fights. To my dismay, after all these years of literature, the academic world is not going to give up on autism. And believe me, if you have any chance of them listening, you can't do it with foolishness. You have to do it with logic and science. So let's get the right fight, and maybe there's still a chance your kids can win this fight. <coughs> now, I'm a pediatrician. I keep coming back to that. When I meet a new patient, I go thoroughly over their medical records. I've had most parents tell me I'm the first doctor that looked at the medical records. <coughs> Please understand something. It's time to get your children back to pediatrics. If you're going to a consultant and they're not paying any attention to what's happened with your kid, walk out the door. That's not medicine. Workup includes lab. I'm looking at markers for general health, for illness, immune viral. If indicated, I would do a spec scan. We got to a point that with the kids who hadn't done alternative medicine, the scans were so predictable, I told them we'll get a scan in a year or two. I don't need a scan to start with. But the kids who've done alternative medicine, I usually want to scan because I know there's abnormalities. The bottom line is, I will also, again, I, I hope I'm practicing legitimate pediatrics. If I've got a problem with your kid, I'm going to refer them to a specialist. That specialist may not understand neuroimmune. They may raise eyebrows even at some stuff, but they can do a job. The endocrinologist can figure out if we're missing something on hormones. Neurologists, unfortunately, are necessary on seizures. Each specialist can do their job, but I'm hoping is we'll get them back to the big picture. So ultimately, over 28 years, this has evolved to what we're terming the Goldberg approach. My policy is based on no potentially harmful treatments or approaches. If you start off with the idea that your children are born normal, they're not truly injured, that I am not allowed to do anything to your child that I wouldn't do to a normal child. Think about that. If you're given an idea that you wouldn't do to a healthy child, it doesn't belong in your kids, unless it's specifically treating a problem, a real problem. Okay? Reduce stresses. The whole key to treating this. If I'm saying you can't throw a bunch of stuff in and make the system behave, the trick is remove the problems. The diet is critical. The diet does have a huge impact on your kids. But that's because anything you throw in their body kicks off that GI tract. So you focus on removing negatives. I look at how can I support the brain, not harm the brain. Support it. And I'm praying that we're going to get to agents that I've been aware of for only about a decade now that for the first time could make immune systems healthy, not push it one way or the other. This is something that was done. We were literally preparing to take my protocol. Now think about this. You've had a lot of people talk to you. They give you their ideas. I, I've lived in a different world. I've lived with good researchers who wouldn't let me go out and promote what I was doing until I documented what I'm doing. So we were going to replicate my protocol to the FDA before this, and, and if you can believe this, in a world that wants to do one thing at a time, we were going to look at food, antiviral, 
under certain conditions, antifungal, SSRI, but it's possible to do that in a scientific protocol. Anyone who's giving you ideas for your children and after 15 years can't give you a protocol, please be suspicious. Don't accept it. Now, you're told children don't get better. I showed you some children that I think I could be very proud of. But look at this. When they were trying to figure out, okay, Mike, who says you're legit? Who says we're supposed to believe you? So anything you do anecdotal is never perfect. But this was a random look at all the kids that presented one year in my practice. And look at, these, look at this curve. This slide will work a little bit. OK. This was the presenting children. Look at this. Now. This is over the course of four or five years. A category meant they were functioning entirely normal, might still need to catch up on some academics, or catch up on something quirky. B meant they were bright, alert, but still not where they should be, C and D. And you can see, in a world that tells you your children can't be helped, there's not one kid there that didn't improve. I won't tell you I have every kid normal. I will not say to you I have every kid where I want them to be. I wish I did. But I will say to you the principles are holding up over time. If you do the right thing to your children, every one of them can improve. I don't have an older child with me that's had to go into a group home. They have brains. They may be very low-level academics, but they're children. So we have to start looking and realizing your children's brains can be helped. Now, I'm going to save some time here. There's a whole section in here about food, about my approach. You all have that in the hand. I want to leave time for questions. So I'm going to skip over this. And I'm going to come to summary. If you take away a word, Everything you're doing for your children changes. And mental functioning is complex. I tell this to parents over and over as a pediatrician. I couldn't begin to sort these kids out if I didn't change one variable at a time. But then you come back to pediatrics. The minute your children come into pediatrics, therapy changes. Speech therapy, think about this a moment. Everybody's happy if your kids can get a word, can develop. A sick kid, the speech pathologist doesn't try to get words. They have to go back and rebuild their oral motor. They have to go back and give them the skills that they missed. And then you get to talking. The same applies to learning. What I have found, the biggest problem is even as the kids get bright, you have to go back and recreate those years two to five. We just, I, I, as a pediatrician, just took it for granted. Kids born, they go off to kindergarten, and they go to school. Getting into this, you suddenly realize all the change two to five. And if the brain is not bright, the brain is not alert, you're not going to get those things back. Recovery is possible. This is the other big message today. Let's get to a world that doesn't tell you your kids can't be helped. Let's get to a world that expects recovery. And I would make an argument, I've been in meetings. Think about this, because with an election year coming, I'm hoping this might be an angle that helps all of you. We're going bankrupt out there. The health system, the education system is collapsing. Doctors are not good economists. Make the joke, but we're very bad. But I've been in meetings that if you throw the switch, if you recognize disease, you're actually on a pathway that you could lower health, education, welfare in the next decade. Again, we don't have an epidemic of a word. We have an epidemic of learning disorders. How many people are talking about our lowered IQ out there? Well, everyone wants to blame parents, because you're always to blame. 
teachers, videos, TV. I would argue if a kid isn't bright, alert, they can't learn anyway. We've got to start recognizing that a lot of kids going to school are not healthy. So, if you look at this, what we tried to come up with was under the ideal of NIDS, you could look at autistic spectrum, ADHD, OCD, chronic fatigue, in a completely different light. And this is the truth. If you, when, when we focus a word. See where you are? All the research, and this is the way our system functions, by the way. Let's study autism. Let's study ADD. Let's study bipolar. Let's study adult ADD. If you put this together and realize that this true spectrum of disorders is an epidemic, then we can get to solutions for all of you. This is not, a, this is not even funny. They talk about 25% of children nowadays have chronic illness. I don't even want to think where the medical world would be if when I was growing up 25% of kids were ill. How do we just accept that and not focus on we need to fix it? If a child isn't going to grow up healthy, they're certainly not going to be a healthy adult. This is a projection. Please tell me with the economy we live in, how any school system is going to take care of this many children coming? When they tell you they're going to, I, I, I'm being very blunt, it's a lie. In the end, there won't be enough resources to take care of everybody. This is not fair to any one of you. Look at this rate of A-word increase, as I showed you earlier. This is impossible under any category but a disease. So, look at this. Keeps going. And by the way, this is partly proof that mercury and vaccines had nothing to do with this. You notice that A word there? They took out, they changed the vaccines, right? They took mercury out. Many of you have chosen not to vaccinate your children, which is a mistake. But do you see any dip in the A word? Not at all. So, how do you change this? Please, it's time to come together. It's time to demand what parents have not done up to this time. Let's get to the Academy of Pediatrics, but not say foolish things. Please forgive me, but when a parent is told, oh, look, your kid has yeast in the bloodstream, or they have yeast in the brain. How many of you have heard that? Are your children alive? <laughs> They'd be dead if it was in the brain or bloodstream. That's fact. So what do you sound like when you go to your doctor and tell them, oh, my kid's got yeast in the bloodstream. The doctors, that's the best way in life to have them not listen to you. Please take this talk, things I skipped over, and start debating with your doctors. But logic, science, not foolishness. We need hearings held immediately in Congress. Not study a word. Figure out how we're going to deal with this medical epidemic in an expedient way and what that means to our education and social system. I, I, I'll give you a nice story, and, I, and I'll bring this to an end, we'll, we'll do question. But I've got a group of kids at a school outside of Dallas, Texas. Originally, I had four kids out of nine. I now have six kids out of nine. The school changed its entire teaching technique based on my kids. I have no question in my mind that if you guys can come together and we can get a recognition, there are teachers, there are educators, there are therapists who want to do the right thing. They're just being told it's a work. Specialists need to come together with an urgency. Think about what I'm saying. The only reason it's not happening is because somehow the system has ingrained in themselves and in all of you that we're really sorry, but something mysteriously happened to your kids and we can't do anything. If you take away the labels and all of a sudden you've got sick kids, think of the urgency. Think of the real crisis that could occur. So, 
new agents are possible that could fix this. I will, forgive me, argue what we're doing is a crime. I've said this to parents. At first I was a little nervous about it. But down in Florida, there was a trial on a Kaylee Anthony, right? Many, if, if any of you listen to the judge's description of child abuse, if we take away a word, the system is abusing your children. They are miserable. They're living, as I pointed out before, with panic attacks, anxiety attacks. They're living in pain. How many of you have been told your children are oblivious to pain? Now, I haven't had one kid I work with that if you help them get well, they feel pain. The thing we're missing is these kids are living in such a level of pain, what's a little more? That's not right. Never grew up that way. So, join in. There's a handout. There'll be more information. There's a group of parents. We're trying to create a focus. You, again, I don't care what you guys call it, but we've got to come together in a movement that says not study more genetics, not do alternative here. We want the medical system to fix our children. And I would encourage you, that is the goal of the NIDS effort. I'm putting up here, this is in your handout. Please check out NIDS.net. If you want to see more recovered children, there's YouTube's up there. For, for the professionals in the audience, our four-year doctor, I gave a talk at Tarzana Hospital. That was delivered to doctors. It, I will tell you, I, I welcome any doctor looking at it and finding anything I say that isn't correct. They might doubt something, like again, I talk about viral titers, but otherwise I've learned my whole life I can say things, I better not be wrong. Thank you.